I used to think that all bacteria was bad. I would um, come home from the hospital. The first thing I did was shower. I was really, you know, obsessed with being clean and antibacterial and microbial soaps. And if my kids had pacifiers or toys that fell on the floor, I was super vigilant about cleaning everything because I didn't want them to put anything dirty back in their mouth and their hands. So I now know that that is not probably the best thing that I was doing and that we all have good bacteria and bad bacteria. So when we think about bacteria, we shouldn't be thinking always about it in a negative context. I want to switch for a second and talk about the role of the gut microbiome. So the gut microbiome is an ecological community of microorganisms. It consists of bacteria, fungi, viruses. There are more than 1,000 different species of known bacteria and over 3 million genes. So that's 150 times more uh, bacterial genes than human genes. And then if we take it to a different level, the gut microbiome contains 100 trillion microorganism cells, which is so tough to put into perspective and to let wrap our brains around, what does that even mean? 100 trillion microorganism cells. But if you think about it, we are 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells. So it's really important that we understand um, our gut bacteria and our bacteria. Two thirds of our microbiota is specific to each individual. It's really our own personal gut blueprint. And 99% of the unique genes in our body are bacterial, which really means we are only 1% human. So we can have bacteria um, in lots of places. We have skin bacteria, vaginal bacteria, but 95% of the bacteria is located in the GI tract. And of that, the vast majority is located in the large intestine. So, you know, one thing that we're gonna talk about and I'm gonna try and explain is that our gut microbiome is really closely linked to our innate immune system and our immunity. And all of those things are impacted by diet. And many people consider the gut microbiome to be the forgotten organ. And that's because those gut microbes that live in us, they're not static. They have a role. We used to think that when we eat, we would just digest our food and then we would poop out the food and, and that the gut microbiome had no role. And we now know that is the farthest thing from the truth. Our gut microbiome is actively involved. It is changing regularly. It is a living entity. And it really is an organ that we need to think about. When our gut microbiome gets altered, um, it has been associated with a host of medical issues. Like at this point, it seems that nearly every medical chronic medical issue that comes up has been linked to the gut microbiome being altered. Rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, fatty liver disease, heart disease, like atherosclerosis, obesity, cancers, pulmonary disease, all of these things have been linked to abnormal gut microbiome. So irritable bowel syndrome has different types of, there are different types of irritable bowel syndrome. It's not just one. You can get irritable bowel syndrome that's predominantly constipation, um, where you're predominantly constipated. You can get IBSD or irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea predominant, and then irritable bowel syndrome mixed where you're alternating between diarrhea and constipation. If you have not seen this Bristol stool chart um, on the right side, I, I recommend you look at it. We have it in our office, uh, in our office space, and I show it to my patients. I think it's really important. Um, and it's a great visual for people because you should take a look at what your poop looks like. Many of my patients don't do that, but it's important to look at the texture, the consistency, look to see the color or if there's blood in it. The Bristol stool chart varies from type one to type seven. Type one, two, and three tends to be um, in patients who are constipated. And if you see this, a very descriptive, colorful descriptions. Um, so type one, separate hard lumps like nuts, hard to pass. On the other spectrum, type seven, 
watery stools, no solid pieces, entirely liquid. The goal is to be close to type four, but many patients with IBS will either be, like I said, type one to three, constipated, or they'll be five through seven, they'll have diarrhea, or they'll alternate. And this was research done, um, again, at a North, University of North Carolina that showed that depending on the type of irritable bowel syndrome you have, whether it's constipation, diarrhea, mixed, um, and then they also looked at healthy controls, your gut microbiome will be different. So there tend to be clusters. Patients who are constipated have a similar gut microbiome makeup. Patients who have diarrhea have a similar gut microbiome makeup. There's another subset of patients with IBS. This is called post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. Now, this occurs when there is a healthy population, a healthy patient, and they get exposure to something. Maybe they had contact with um, somebody who had a GI illness. They ate something that was abnormal. Anyway, they had some exposure and they develop an acute gastroenteritis or an acute bout of diarrhea and some infection in their GI tract. Now, the vast majority of those patients will recover, but some of those patients will go on to develop post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. The risk of developing irritable bowel syndrome is six times greater after a GI infection and the incidence of post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome can range between five to about 32%. So what is it about those patients that they were healthy before and now they're in that subset that has developed post-infectious IBS? Well, one, they could have some sort of genetic susceptibility. They could have intestinal inflammation, intestinal permeability, meaning that their gut epithelial cell and their GI tract is weakened. They could have some sort of altered sensory motor function. They could have had a more severe case of a GI illness or gastroenteritis. They are more likely to have had some psychiatric or psychologic disturbance um, that could be dependent on the bacterial and viral pathogen they had. And it tends to be seen more often in females who are younger. But what it does show you is that some people who have this altered GI tract will go on to develop post-infectious GI post-infectious IBS, whereas in general, those people who recover have a healthy gut microbiome to begin with. We know that the gut microbiome is altered in post-infectious IBS. There have been lots of research studies to show this. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, importantly, what impacts our gut microbiome. So as I mentioned, we have trillions of gut microbes and we have good microbes and bad micro microbes. And it's important that they are in balance and they live in harmony with each other and with them and with us as the um, human host. When they become imbalanced and we have an infection or we have inflammation or a weakened immune system, then we tend to see increases and rises in the unhealthy gut microbiome and uh, unhealthy gut microbes, which leads to other diseases down the line. So one of the first ways that we know our gut microbiome is influenced is the mode of our delivery. Whether we had a vaginal delivery or a C-section is one of the first ways that we're introduced to our gut microbes. When patients have vaginal delivery, we are introduced to vaginal microbes. For example, lactobacillus. This is a healthy gut microbiome, a healthy gut microbe. And this allows normal introduction of gut microbes, and it tends to lead to normal development of an immune system. In people who are born via C-section, they're introduced first to skin flora and usually to staphylococcus, which unfortunately is one of the um, bad or harmful gut microbes. This can lead to abnormal microbial introduction, and studies and research has shown that this can lead to increased risk for other diseases like asthma, celiac disease. So I'm not saying this to worry or cause concern to anybody. Of course, we can't go back and change the way that we were born, right? Um, so all I am telling you is that there are things that are not in control that are going to influence our gut microbiome. 
But we have a lot of things that we can do and ways that we can change our gut microbiome to have a really robust, strong microbiome. So that research um, article or that research that came out suggesting that, you know, potentially it's healthier and there's better gut microbes if you have a vaginal delivery actually resulted in a lot of public um, discussion about this. And there was a thought that should C-section babies even get wiped down with vaginal microbes. And at this point, that is not FDA approved. Um, and so it's not evidence-based. But in the future, as we learn more about this and do more research, it, you know, it's definitely a good theory and a good thought that maybe we might in the future be wiping babies down with vaginal microbes um, to get that healthy gut, that vaginal flora that they would otherwise have gotten. <laughs>